these were not Egyptians. Again, these were not Egyptians. The fire mummy portraits were portrayals of Greek settlers in Roman occupied Egypt. Don't believe me, believe archaeologist Dr. Susan Walker, who says the portraits represented the coming together of the pre existing Egyptian culture and the minority Greek settlers. Egyptology Online says the fire mummies themselves were, quote, those of Greek or Roman settlers who had adopted Egyptian burial customs. Okay, so. What then did the Egyptians of yore look like? In this video, we're going to be cruising through depiction after depiction of the ancient Egyptians as done by the ancient Greeks and Romans. Now you will struggle to find the Greeks and Romans sculpting, painting or drawing indigenous Egyptians any differently to what you're about to see. I tried. Mr. Imhotep in his video on this topic tried too. But just like him, I struggled to find Greco-Roman portrayals of Egyptians looking like the people you see in the Fion portraits. Some of what you're about to see, I didn't believe myself at first. So I checked, and I double checked, and there was still a lot of doubt in my heavily colonised mind about this stuff. That was until I took a trip to this place. This is the British Museum at Great Russell Street, London where I saw one particular depiction of a famous Egyptian pharaoh created by an ancient Greek artist. I saw this depiction with my own two eyes, live in the flesh, not on a phone or a laptop screen, and it blew me away. I recorded this part of my visit to the museum and I've included it in this video just for you beautiful people watching and listening. I've saved it for last though, so make sure you're still here at the tail end of this video for that reveal. But first, here's a Greek vase of an Egyptian male wrestling a crocodile. Now how do we know this is an Egyptian and not just a generic black person? Easy. We do the same thing historians often do so well when it suits them. Piece together historical knowledge available to us in order to make sense of artifacts from the past. Notice I said, when it suits them. And I say that because whenever reconstructing the past means presenting black history in a more impressive light, the ancient history cartel often develops this weird amnesia and all of a sudden, places like the Met Museum exhibit vases like this one with no more information than a crocodile attacking a black African youth. Failing to draw your attention to these rings drawn around the crocodile's hands and feet. What are they? Ancient Greek historian Herodotus tells us that the Egyptians had a practice of taming Nile crocodiles. He also said that they put hanging ornaments of molten stone and gold around the anklets and front feet of these crocodiles. But not only that, some of the ancient Egyptians hunted, rode and performed acrobatic stunts with these crocodiles. Roman writer Pliny the Elder said that there is a race of men also who are peculiarly hostile to this animal. They are known as the Tentyrite, from an island in the Nile which they inhabit. These men are, he says, quote, the only men who dare to attack the creature. They even swim in the river after it and mount its back like so many horsemen, end quote. Just like you can see with this Roman sculpture right here, labelled accurately by Carol Radato on Flickr as a statue, quote, showing a member of the Tentyrite, tribe of Egypt, famous for diving on the backs of crocodiles in the Nile, end quote. And in an obscure online Forbes article, you'll find something called the Palestrina mosaic, depicting Egyptians hunting down a crocodile in the Nile supposedly so it can be taken to perform somewhere like the Roman Colosseum. Now what do the Egyptian crocodile tamers in the mosaic resemble? <clears throat> I'll just come out and say it, they look like Africans, authentic black Africans. And by the way, many Africans around the Nile and even in West Africa still crocodile surf till today. Next are a series of artisan sculptures of everyday people in Egypt during the period of Greek rule. Here's an image of a flute player, basically a street busker, found in Alexandria and dated between 300 and 100 BC. Here's a sleeping street trader from Alexandria again around 300 BC. And here is what looks like a beggar 
once again from Greek-occupied Egypt dating from between 100 to 50 BC. Here's another Greek sculpture from about 180 BC showing what appears to be an actress or orator in Alexandria, Egypt. And here are some fettered Egyptian youths, perhaps criminals or slaves. Now all these have two things in common I want to draw your attention to. First, the very obvious. They are all from Alexandria, Egypt. Alexandria, Egypt is right here. This is as north of Egypt as you can get, right on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. Now this far removed from Egypt proper, a city on the edge of the Mediterranean, Greek settlers and newcomers are still finding the population of Egypt so dominated by blacks that when they sculpt people from daily Alexandrian life, they're sculpting these black figures again and again. And this isn't even getting into Upper Egypt yet, that is to say Southern Egypt, where you would have found less of a mixing of past invaders like the Assyrians, Babylonians and Persians with the indigenous Egyptians. But where are all the Greek sculptures of the olive Mediterranean looking Egyptians who supposedly Herodotus just can't help describing as having woolly hair and being black? Maybe they all went on holiday, all of them, for a few hundred years? The second striking thing is this hairstyle, the knotted short dreads. Does it remind you of anything? Well it does me. These wall relief after wall relief of what Egyptologists today claim are wigs. Not that the Egyptians didn't wear wigs, but surely not all of them wore wigs and if they did, why do they resemble black people's hair in lock fashion? I mean why are Levantine and Mediterranean types fashioning their wigs after black people's hair and not in the same style as their Assyrian and Babylonian brethren? So the next time you see this weird mushroom hairstyle in another Hollywood movie, no, this is rubbish. What they should be showing you, for the most part, at least, are black people wearing twisted locks like this. You can even see Egyptian wall art showing this process being achieved naturally. No wigs. Imagine seeing pictures of white kids wearing high tops a thousand years from now and some historian from Harvard claiming they were all wigs and had nothing to do with black American culture. That's Egyptology today. And it's the same Egyptology that hides Greek depictions of Egyptians on vases like this one from you. I'll give you a quick rundown of what's going on in this image. In Greek mythology, Hercules is supposed to have found himself in Egypt at a time when it was ruled by Busiris, a cruel Egyptian pharaoh who had a thing for sacrificing foreigners to the gods. He tried it with Hercules and Hercules ended up taking out pharaoh Busiris and his priests. The man with the club and the lion skin draped over him here is Hercules and the man he's strangling is pharaoh Busiris. There's something funny looking about Busiris there. Hmm, I wonder what it is. Again and again, when the ancient Greek artists depict this story of Hercules and King Busiris on their hydrias, they are depicting Hercules fighting Egyptian priests who have distinctive African features. Sometimes the people in the pictures have more distinctive features than others, and in others all you're left to go on is things like distinctively flat noses or pronounced prognathus meaning foolish lips and pronounced rounded jaw area, what the Egyptologist Volney when he saw the sphinx called a quote puffed visage. Okay so you might ask, why are some of these more accurate depictions of the stereotypical black African than others? Well imagine you're a Greek artist and you'd been asked to draw an image of an African man having never seen one. You'd have had to imagine a black person from descriptions given to you by others. Remember this depiction of a crocodile from earlier. The sculptor here has obviously had to imagine a crocodile from descriptions given to him as opposed to actually knowing for himself what a crocodile looked like. It's a little like what this Roman painter does when commissioned to draw Nihilus, a minor Greek god that was supposed to rule over the Nile River. Obviously the painter had never seen a black person before but he knows they're considerably darker than Greeks so he paints him like this, showing him holding up the goddess Isis who he just decides to not bother painting accurately at all. But note Nihilus' slightly pug nose 
and his much fuller upper and lower lips. Compare that with how another European artist called Philip Gull depicts Nihilus a thousand plus years later during the European Renaissance period. Clearly an attempt at a black man from someone who might have been in two minds about offending the aesthetic sensibilities of Europeans and being artistically accurate. But someone who didn't care about offending anybody was the painter of this Greek vase. And this is the one. What you are looking at is a vase I found in the British Gallery on a visit earlier this year. Actually, let me be honest here and say my wife actually spotted this on our visit. She shouted, come over here, babe, look at this one. And everyone in the museum was like, sheesh, chill. We don't need to alert the blacks to these ones. But she just ignored them. And this, my friends, was our reaction. Interesting. Uh, Sorry. No, go on, what do you say? So these are two, they're clearly black, right? A painting inscription identifies one of the attendants as Amasis, the, the name of the then reigning Egyptian pharaoh. And Memnon's and attendant to him. No, yeah. it's only the attendant is Amasis, which is the reigning Egyptian pharaoh, or then that would make him black. Then. So I worry with two black African attendants. He is Memnon, mythical king of Ethiopia, who was led to kill children. Um, a painted inscription, and this was one of the attendants, a massive. <laughs> Who? The, the, then, the name of the then reigning Egyptian pharaoh. Take a picture of that. The Master of the British on. Museum. On. It's just a joke. Do that clearly because you're going to need that in the video. Oh, you can get loads of stuff today. Oh, come on. And here's a better audio and narration when I had calmed myself down. So here we have um, a warrior with two black African attendants. He is Memnon, mythical king of Ethiopia, who was later killed in the Trojan War. A painted inscription identifies one of the attendants as Amasis, the name of the then reigning Egyptian pharaoh. Let's have a look at Memnon, who is the mythical king attended by two warriors, one of which is Amasis, an Egyptian pharaoh. Let's have a look. There we have Memnon in the middle, mind the glare, and you've got his two attendants, one of which is Amasis. You can see at the top there it says Amasis. Now, what would you say that man looks like? Would you say it's fair to say that that pharaoh, depicted by the ancient Greeks, Amasis, would, you, would it be fair to say he was black? Or he looks black? You've got the tight curls at the top, you've got the flat broad nose and the thick lips there. But yet, no proof that the Egyptians were black people. Okay, so who's Amasis, you might ask? That's the Greek name for this guy, Amose II, who was the reigning Egyptian pharaoh at the time this vase, or what you might call a hydria, was made. Now, what's interesting about this is you always get this fake argument that only the 25th dynasty had black pharaohs. But Amose II, or Amasis to the Greeks, was actually from the 26th dynasty. So this late into Egyptian history, at a time after the Hiskos, the Assyrians, the Babylonians and Persians had had their period of invading Egypt and the Greeks were just about to do the same thing, the 26th dynasty had a pharaoh the world clearly knew was a black African man. At least the Greeks knew. One last image. And I think this one is important because it shows how late into the game Europe was when it was still admitting the ancient Egyptians were black. This is St. Mark's Basilica finished in its current state about a thousand years ago 
during the Byzantine Roman era. Inside the church are artistic depictions of different groups and nations of people. Here in the interior is the Byzantine depiction of the Arab peoples. People who without hesitation, many would say look something like the popular image of modern Egyptians today. The next image I'm about to show you is in the same building and it's of Egyptians. Here it is. So in just over a thousand years from Christ and little under a thousand years from us today, the Romans were conceiving of Egyptians as this. I guess the Romans were woke black washers as well, right? Now I need to know guys, at this stage, do we boycott anything Hollywood does that purports to shed light on ancient Egypt without accepting its blackness? I'm actually at that stage now. I have children, black children, and although I loved watching the Ten Commandments with my dad as a child, and later on things like The Mummy, I'm at the stage now where I'm realising these films were part of a malicious deception, not just ignorance meant to denigrate us because in these films you will see black people but always as slaves bodyguards or circus performers not as the pharaohs themselves where they belong there is no way you have billions of dollars for your film budget and whilst doing research for these movies not stumble across what i presented to you in this video so why does it take people like mr himotep Kweli Mika, Know Thyself, and now Troll Black, swimming against the tide just to bring these historical truths to a mass audience. What is it about blacks that makes the world afraid of acknowledging our greatness alongside all the other great peoples of the world? The Indians, the Chinese, and yes, white Europeans. Are we really the most feared race on earth? And if so, why are we? Well, you'll have to stay tuned to us on this channel to find out. Support us by liking and subscribing, but also by visiting us on trollblack.myshopify.com to get one of our amazing shirts that help to rep the culture. Anyway, till the next time, we're Troll Black, no doubt.